that. Good morning, everyone. All right, my name is Mano Paul. I'm the president and CEO of Secure Risk Solutions. Uh, but a one-line bio of who I am is I'm a shark biologist turned security guy. It gives me good pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Tassaro. To many of you, he probably needs no introduction. Uh, but for the benefit of those who... Uh... I'll turn off that. All right. <laughs> Let's do this again. I was going to say it wasn't me, like from a shaggy line, you know. So um, it gives me pleasure to introduce Matt Tassaro. Um, for many of you, he needs no introduction, but for those uh, who don't know Matt, Matt Tassaro is currently the team lead of enterprise cybersecurity for Rackspace and has worked in a web application development and security since 2000. Outside work, he is the project lead for the OWASP Live CD project. He's a member of the OWASP Foundation Board and a part of the Austin OWASP chapter leadership. Uh, he's also a very active member and a speaker and has spoken internationally and domestically in many conferences. Uh, but that's kind of the official formal introduction. Just before the introduction, I ended up uh, uh, talking to Matt and, asked, and I asked him, hey Matt, give me some dirt on you. And uh, essentially he told me, why don't you go get it yourself, right? And my response to him was, I'm afraid what I would find. Um, in that regard, it's actually something that you want to know about Matt. There are actually two other Matts, actually the two other M. Tassaros. There's a Matt Tassaro who's a professional wrestler, and there's a Mary Tassaro, uh, and until off late, he's been getting these soliciting, e soliciting emails asking, are you single, uh, are you hot? Uh, let the audience kind of, uh, you know, uh, that's Mary Tassaro. And uh, so, uh, then this is not him. This is Matt Tassaro from OASP. And with, uh, without any further ado, over to you, Matt. Testing, testing, we good? Yay, we got good levels. I don't need that. Well, hello, welcome to LastCon 2011. Um, I'm gonna talk today about AppSec, the AppSec ecosystem and embrace the fail. Um, oddly enough, I was telling James a minute ago, I actually had a completely different talk in mind. Ooh, I knew when, uh, last year when I did this, Josh was going to have me do it again this year. And I was gathering information and interesting topics, sort of throwing it into a big bucket, planning this talk. And if, well, I guess it was two or three weeks ago, James had sort of cornered me and said, what, what is it going to be? Do you have a title? I'm like, oh, I really don't have a title yet, but you know, I throw everything in a bucket, I pull it out, I sort it, and I sort of make it fit, add in bits, and, and come up with a talk. And this was not what it was going to be, but I'm really happy with what it turned out with. Uh, hopefully, you will be as well. So a little bit about me, beyond what uh, Mana was nice enough to say. I started out life, actually, as a developer uh, in College Station uh, for an international telecom whose, yeah, whoop, uh, international telecom whose uh, main IT operations, for whatever reason, were in Bryan College Station, although most of our business was in uh, Belgium, France, and other parts of Europe which is interesting because when your app dies, it's 2 a.m. here when it's broken in the morning there, which is a good incentive to write good apps. Uh, spent some time as a DBA assist admin, a pen tester, and I'm now an, I would call myself an app, application security uh, professional. You may see a little bit of bias about Linux and open source in this talk. I've been using Linux primarily since 2000 as my main OS when I have a choice. Um, I am on the board of OWASP. Uh, the, the OWASP Foundation, uh, trying to help keep our mission successful. And I'm now one of the security peeps at Rackspace as of October 3rd. So a couple of things, right? This talk includes a lot of speculations, and I'm going to dive into a lot of different subject areas, some of which I don't know all that much about. So if I make mistakes, hey, it's, I'm a human. That happens. But I'm trying to keep it interesting and diverse. Um, and the intention of this talk is sort of expand your view of application security. Right, and to get you to think a little bit and hopefully, so hopefully help you kind of level up your AppSec skills. And the views of this talk do not represent OWASP, my employer, the panhandler you saw driving in today, or anybody else. Right? It's just me talking about AppSec and what I think about it. So let's do a wee bit of history. Um, way back in 2010, there was this LastCon thing, and I did the keynote at it. And at the keynote, I tried to make three major points. Right? Number one. Software is everywhere, right? You can't really live a life now without interacting with software. It's just, it's virtually impossible. Well, maybe there's some people in West Virginia or something up in the mountains, but, or North Georgia, I used to live in Atlanta. There's some people up there that don't have running water. I doubt they have software. Um, 
But for the most part, it's hard to interact in life now without touching software. Second point I tried to make, right, is that software has problems. We all know this, right? If we're in the tech industry, one of the reasons we get paid is because software isn't perfect. And then the third point I made last year was that OWASP is visibility. And one of our key missions is to provide visibility into the application security space so that people can make informed decisions, either purchasing or using software. Right? So just a little bit of recap. Software is everywhere. This was so good last year, I had to repeat it. Barbie and my daughter actually wanted this last Christmas. And gosh darn it, every time I went to the store, they just happened to be out. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And the internet was also out of them. Um, had, a, had a stinking camera embedded in her chest. And you could like use your Barbie to record things, which is just way too crazy and, and big brothery for me. So regrettably, Josie didn't get that. But Barbie now is embedded with software, right? And you can hack Barbie if you want to. <laughs> and there's a YouTube video of how this guy disassembled Barbie. I mean, I love it, right? What'd you do this weekend? Oh, I hacked Barbie. I have a, now a, a spy cam, huh? right? Fun stuff. Now there's uh, butterflies in jars. This is an update from last year. Think Geek has these things. There's a little embedded chip up in the, the top of this jar that senses motion and then makes those little butterflies flap their rings if it hears or senses motion or sound, right? So we now have electronic butterflies in a jar filled with software. OK, software has problems. Oh, yes, this, this was December of last year. There was a programming error which caused a Russian rocket to actually fail to make it to orbit and sort of explode, which is a bad thing, right? This is a software with problem. And this was a rather expensive problem. It was a navigation satellite for the Russians, which I'm sure isn't cheap in rubles or dollars. And that thing kind of fell out of the sky and went boom. And then last year, I talked about Air France Flight 447 uh, that happened in 2009. It was actually a flight from Brazil to Paris, uh, somewhere over the Atlantic. They suddenly lost uh, control of the plane, and it basically nosedived into the Atlantic. 228-odd people were killed. Um, they spent two years searching around for the black box the, that was described in one article I read that was kind of interesting, like trying to find an item the size of a shoebox in Paris in 3,000 feet of water. Surprisingly, they found it. They actually have the black box. And what they've been able to determine is that yes, there were two uh, uh, speed sensors called pitot or pitot. This is where my, my I don't know planes very well. P-I-T-O-T -E -E sensors that uh, gauged the speed of the plane for the autopilot. There was some freezing on them, and they started arguing about what the real speed of the plane was. Right side, the left side said it was so much. The right, the right side said it was a different speed, and they literally were sort of fighting over how fast the plane was going. Uh, the way the software contended with this contention and disagreement between the two sensors was to turn off the autopilot. The captain was in the back taking a nap or just resting. He wasn't in the cockpit at the time. The two co-pilots were there. Um, they struggled with the plane. Apparently, uh, the training for these planes does not include what to do when the autopilot shuts off when you're really high in the air flying over the Atlantic. And unfortunately, it seems like the pilot pulled up on the stick too high, caused an aerodynamic stall, and bam, it went into water. So it's a combination of software issues and pilot air, right? Oh, yeah, two years to find that guy. It was May of this year that they finally pulled that guy out of the ocean, which I'm, I'm blown away they were actually able to do it. Another issue of software having problems, this just happened last week. Jaguars were calling 18,000 cars because the software that controls the cruise control has a little bit of a problem where it doesn't turn off, right? <laughs> That's OK. They have a workaround. They tell you to just turn off the ignition at speed. <laughs> Right, which in some cases turns off the power steering. But, you know, hey, this is definitely an upgrade from the Prius I talked about last year that would also suddenly accelerate and cause problems, right? If you're going to crash and die in a car, that's a pretty sweet car to crash and die in. I mean, way better than a Prius, I'm sorry. I mean, not eco-friendly, but hey, sweet car. Ah, OWASP is visibility. The other point I tried to make last year is there was sort of this cycle, and Jeff Williams talked about this, I think, first, uh, one of the former board members of OWASP, we have this cycle where we implicitly trust software, right? You get a phone, and you want an app, and you poke it a few times, and now you have the new app to do what? You know, Angry Birds, right? You poke your phone about four times, you have Angry Birds, and now you can flick birds around. Right? You trust that that software is going to work, and it's going to do what it should. Just kind of blindly, that's what we do. That's what we've been trained to do. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that trust isn't well-deserved. 
And when, the, when the, the app sort of fails us, we're going to blame the software, right? We throw the, the developers primarily under the bus, or the producer of the software under the bus. Unfortunately for the developers or the, the software producers, that provides a huge incentive for them to just sort of be quiet about the problems, right? You don't want to talk about the problems, because the last time there was a problem, you got thrown under the bus, right? So we're not going to talk about any problems with our software. We're just going to feed into you blindly trusting it, right? Because everything's OK. Right? This is unfortunately very toxic to producing secure software. This sort of ecosystem of trust, blame, and hide doesn't help us produce uh, secure software. And also, Jeff talked about this uh, uh, cycle of visibility, right? where all these different pieces of the AppSec uh, puzzle to make software, they all need to sort of have visibility into each other's processes. And unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, there's a lot of silos. And group A doesn't talk to group B. And it would just be nice if we could all get along. And to quote, I guess who was the, I forget the guy in LA who got beat up, uh, who said, can't we all just get along? Dang, who was that guy? Anyway, can't remember his name. Rodney King? Yeah, Rodney King. There you go. Can't we all just get along? And also, we talked about a security facts thing, where it's basically like a nutrition label for software. And I think this is a really cool idea. Maybe we're not ready uh, maturity-wise as an organ, as a, as a as a whole, whatever the industry isn't ready to do this, but even internally, one of the things they have in here is like, what are all the libraries used in your software? Is that written anywhere where you work? Do you know that you have lib this and lib that? Or are several Apache Commons projects tacked together in your software so that if there's a vulnerability in one, you might actually be able to trace it back and patch your thing? Probably not. So there's some really good ideas embedded in this, and I would encourage you to go find Jeff's talk on this. Uh, see me afterwards, I can, I can point you out where it is. The other point I made, and this is sort of my vision of the software industry, right? We're sort of like a boat at the sea. There's a big, ugly iceberg out there. And right now, we're worried about the top. And the top bit is software vulnerabilities, right? And yes, those are cool and sexy if you find them. And they're scary if you have them. But quite honestly, there's a whole lot more that we're not even talking about. And really, I would like to at some point get to the discussion where we're not talking about just the security vulnerabilities, but we're talking about things like change control source code management, strategy, metrics, policy and compliance, education and training, threat assessment, security requirements, all these various and sundry things that it takes to produce secure software. Right? They're not particularly sexy, I'll be honest with you. Right? I mean, if you say, I'm the, I'm the uh, policy and compliance guy, that's probably not going to get you dates at AppSec events. Right? Not the best thing. But quite honestly, these are all important things that we just have to do. Um, so I'm hoping at some point we can move the conversation there. OK, so that's, that's a retrospective on last year. Let's talk about what we can do today. Last year's was a bit high level. I tried to inject some more real world, take this back to your organization and make things happen. Right? Well, my first thing is fail early and fail often. Right. I love this. Failure, we can't spell failure without you. Right? Failure, it's priceless. Failure coming to a face near you. <laughs> failure, failures are divided into two cases. Those who thought and never did, and those who did and never thought. I love that. How do you, how do you lose a snowplow in the ice? That's just, that's, that's awesome. I love this one too, right? Failure, now availability for delivery. You think that the guys who drive the uh, Oscar Mayer car, the little Wienermobile, didn't realize it's slightly bigger than your average vehicle? I mean, the thing's a, a bus basically shaped like a hot dog. And the epic fail. I don't know how you flip over a tank, but that's pretty amazing, because I know those are rather heavy devices. Um, but somebody managed, which is pretty awesome. Really, though, all this talk about failure is, I, I think one of the things we're doing as an industry is we're not learning from failure. And it's, it's easy to find examples of failure. It's not so easy to find examples of how we're taking that failure and trying to derive some value from it. How can we learn from failure, right? Uh, and, and quite honestly, and this may be an American thing, it may be just a human thing, but we worship at the altar of its success, right? Everything's like, we got to succeed. We got to have you know, no failure. Failure's not an option. Go, go, go. Well, quite honestly, there are, generally speaking, more failures than there are successes. So if you want to pick a class of things to learn from, you might want to pick a class of things that happen more often. 
And I'm assuming there's no one in the room that has an empty bug tracker back home at the office, right? There's lots of failures. We have lots of opportunity to learn here. And if you think about it, this is not unlike test-driven development, right? Where you write some test cases, and they fail until you write code to make them pass, right? And that's actually a fairly clueful way to develop software, right? We could probably get a lot better software if we were more people were sort of uh, had that mindset. Right? Oh, yes. I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that did, wouldn't work. Do we know who this is? Edison. Yes, this is Thomas Edison about the light bulb, right? He just couldn't figure out a light bulb 10,000 times, but 10,001 apparently was a magic number, and now we have light bulbs. And then interestingly enough, in April of 2001, the Harvard Business Review had an entire, uh, uh, an entire publication that month was all about failure, right? how to understand it, how to learn from it, and how to recover it. So failure is maybe the new black, right? Hey, let's embrace the fail. And this is actually a really fascinating thing. Some of these articles you can pull for free. Some of it's behind a paywall. But it's a pretty good read. One great example of failure that actually is somewhat applicable to software, right? Alan Mulally, he was uh, formerly at Boeing. I can't remember what his position was. He became the president and CEO at Ford. And in 2006, when this happened, Ford was not doing very well, right? They were really hurting. And he came in and he said to his direct reports, look, when we have meetings, I want you to come to me, and in these status reports, I want you to color code them, right? I want green if everything's good, red if everything's bad, and, you know, orange and yellow if there's some sort of mix in between, right? Stoplight, right? Red, yellow, green. Well, he was fairly astonished at his first meeting when he saw a sea of green reports even though Ford was losing several billion dollars, right? How do you get a sea of green when you have seven billion dollars of losses? There should be a few problems, you know, that bubble up to the, the upper level of management, right? And unfortunately, at Ford, there was not a culture that said it was okay to fail or to talk about problems. We could only talk about successes. And quite honestly, that wasn't really working for Ford. When you're losing several billion a year, that's not a success, even if you color it green. Right? So are your scrums a sea of green, right? Do you have a culture in your organization where people can talk about failures and not feel like they're going to be branded as the guy who brought the news and therefore let's go kill the messenger, right? Can they safely talk about problems? Because that's a huge issue, I think, in AppSec. People don't want to talk about the problems. Okay, so let's manage failure, right? And uh, Amy C. Edmondson in that Harvard Business Review wrote this article, Strategies for Learning from Failure, and she talked about Productive versus unproductive failures. I mean, there's some failures that, that you just, you're not really going to learn from. If you were driving here today and you ran over a nail and you got a flat tire, yeah, it's a failure, but you're really, it's a sort of an act of God thing, right? You're not going to learn much from that. But if you have 50,000 mile rated tires and you're at 80,000 miles and it blows out, there is something you could learn from that. Like maybe change out your tires regularly when they're about to go. That might be a good clue, right? One of the other interesting things in this article was she talked about testing early with rough prototypes. And prototyping is, is not anything new in the software industry. But one of the interesting things that came out of her research was that she found that users were much more frank in their reporting of problems if what they looked at didn't look fully baked. Right? If the prototype was pretty rough and non-finished, and it was obvious just from observing it, they were much more candid than if they saw this final shiny thing that they were supposed to evaluate. And I'm assuming this is somewhat human nature, not wanting to uh, you know, call somebody's baby ugly in essence, right? But so this is actually a case where having those rough and ready prototypes out in front of people early can actually get you better results. And there's actually an incentive to not have a really finished shiny prototype before you show it off. Unfortunately, most people wait till it's just pre-production before you do a user acceptance test. And that's not maybe the best place to get the most candid user acceptance responses. Right? And then just always learning from failures, right? Oh, this is an interesting thing. The Tartar Group, which is a large conglomerate in India, they actually have a prize for the best failed idea every year. Intuit has fail parties, where when the, the great idea that just doesn't happen, they actually have a party around it. They embrace it. Ford Motor Company, uh, Henry Ford, the original founder, it, Ford Motor that we buy today was his third motor company, right? Two failures, the third one success, right? We have to be able to learn from failure, and Ford did good, and 
Carter Group and, and Intuit are at least making it okay to fail. Right? So let's, let's talk about some real world, these are sort of high level researchy things. Let's talk about some real world lessons from technology and failure and get a drink. Okay, so let's pick some recent large failures and see if we can learn from them. Like, let's say the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. That was a, a monumental failure, and there's a few lessons we can pull out of that. And then also, let's talk about Fukushima nuclear plant, right? There's another case of some pretty spectacular failure. So we have these two failures that happened recently. What can we learn from them that we can take home and, and put in our practices? One thing, let's talk about expansion and growth of technology, right? It isn't a nice, linear, smooth thing, right? It doesn't expand like a balloon in, in all directions, right? It's not a balloon. It's not even a cute horse balloon, right? The expansion is not even. It's unevenly distributed, right? There's technology that just sort of happens in a direction, and it's random, and there aren't associated technologies that ride along with it at the same pace, right? Usually tech is expanding in a particular direction to solve a particular problem, and it's much more of a point solution as, po as opposed to sort of a, a global uh, solution, which makes, if you were to figure out a shape for technology expansion, much more like an urchin, where you have these few technology things going out. There's a core of sort of solid technology, but the rest, the sort of bleeding edge, so to speak, are those spines. So, Unfortunately, though, those spines are brittle, and they sort of stand alone, right? If you have a point solution for something, you're worried about solving that problem. You're not worried about sort of ancillary or tangential problems, right? And when a spine breaks, right, the tech to fix that problem generally isn't available, or it's certainly not as mature, right? You weren't worried about how you were going to fix the problem. You were worried about, well, you were worried about how you were going to solve a problem with technology. You weren't worried about how you were going to solve it when it breaks, which, I mean, come on, tech, it breaks. We know that. That's why we have jobs. Right? And if you look at both uh, the Deepwater Horizon and the Fukushima incidents, they both had cases where the tech to fix the problems was not nearly as mature as the problems they, uh, the problems they had. Right? And, and the technology that was driving them to the solution of getting oil from really deep, or in the case of Fukushima, making nuclear energy, the tech around them wasn't quite up to speed. And when that happens, right, what you're left with is improvisation, right? Uh, and a lot of floundering, which was evident in both those cases, and basically a lot of mess, right? Because you've relied on this little spine of technology to get you out on the edge and solve a problem, but when that thing breaks, you're in free space, right? There's really no support mechanism for you anymore. And that happened, I think, in both of those cases. So let's look about some rules to deal with tech failure, right? What, you, what can you get out of Fukushima and deep water? Clicky, there we go. Number one, right? Even if things seem safe and secure on a day-to-day -day basis, disasters are going to happen. And we all love to live in this blue sky, green field world, but it's just not the case, right? And usually disasters happen when they're probably the worst possible time, right? So how do you stop this? Look for assumptions you've made and question them, right? Have you made assumptions that may not be true or may not at least be safe and think about them and question them, right? And very low chance doesn't mean never. And this bites a lot of us. Oh, that'll never happen once in a blue moon. Well, guess what? Every once in a while you get a blue moon. What's going to happen? Right? In the case of uh, deep water, they just assumed that at great depth these blow-up preventers were going to work because they worked at shallower depths. So I mean, if we drop them another 10,000 feet, whatever it was, hey, no problem. It's going to work fine. Well, it didn't quite work out fine. And Fukushima was, well, just generally a mess. <laughs> They thought partial meltdowns were going to be unlikely. They had two sources of power, one of which was grid, the other was um, generators, and they just assumed at least one of those are always going to be working. Well, when you have an earthquake that takes out power and then a tsunami that floods your basement where your generators are, you suddenly don't have power, right? They didn't consider that as an option. That was one of the key sort of chain of events that made Fukushima go south. Uh, two, develop some broadly applicable technology for mitigation before it's needed. You don't have to absolutely solve the problem, but at least think about it. What are we going to do if our API completely disappears and our load balances lose their mind? Like, what's the CYA backup plan? At least have a plan, right? Fukushima had no idea what to do when they lost their two sources of power. 
They were just, they were just in, in uh, open territory, and it was pretty awful, right? If you did a threat model, right, did you sow some unmitigated risks? Those are the things I'm talking about, right? Maybe you're, as a business, you decide we're going to accept that risk, but you should at least have a conversation about, OK, what happens if this risk actually does manifest? I know it's very unlikely, but what are we going to do? At least have a plan. So it's not the uh, international sign of panic when the inevitable happens. Oh, and then, yeah, this is, this is tech, a perfect example of tech, right? We have cross-site scripting all the application vulnerabilities out there, and then we go, hey, maybe we could have this mitigating control called a WAF, right? That's sort of a, a cart horse mentality, and it's, it's backwards. It would be better if we could sort of think about how are we going to mitigate issues before we actually make them. I don't know that we'll ever get there, but it sure would be nice. Ah, in the case of deep water, right, the, 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 the technology to repair really deep leaks is only now being researched because of deep water, right? They realize that, gee, these assumptions we made about those uh, uh, blow-up preventers really don't hold in super deep water. What are we going to do? And people are now researching that, as well as researching how do you clean up freaking enormous oil spills in a somewhat safe and uh, eco-friendly way, right? Those are two things that they just never considered. And then Fukushima, shockingly, they lacked robotic access to some areas. So when they needed to show off some of the valves, it was too radioactive to send in people. And they had no way to get to those valves. And they just sort of had to sit back and watch. And I think a few people actually, God bless them, took the hit and went in and turned off those valves. And they're going to live a much shorter life for doing that. But it's kind of shocking that in a nuclear reactor, you don't have some sort of robotic access to areas that can get uh, highly radiated, radiified, radiation, high levels of radiation, something like that. Right? I was kind of surprised when I started reading into it that they just they didn't think about that. I mean, it's a nuclear reactor. There's a high chance there's going to be high levels of radiation in there, and robots are kind of cool with radiation, certainly much better than humans. And then number three, situational awareness is invaluable. And I, I used to work with an ex-military guy, and he kind of knew this. I don't know if it was a military. I, I don't have any military in my background. Um, I don't know if this is a military thing that they just teach you, because I don't have that experience. Um, but he got this, and there's a lot of people that don't get this. Knowing what's going on is a huge part of solving a problem. And in a lot of cases, when you're trying to answer the what's going on, you're like, geez, I don't know, I guess we can kind of look over here, or I think we logged something over there, and I, you do what? Right? We don't have situational awareness. So what is right now happening to your application? Do you know? Is somebody trying to pop it? Is it doing fine? Is it uh, eating up all the CPU on the server? What's going on? Most people, no clue. Uh, and the OWASP app sensor, I think, is really good. I'm going to delay that bit for later, so uh, be patient with me. Uh, Deepwater Horizon, they had a single gauge to monitor the blowout preventer. One gauge at whatever crazy depth that was. And this is not like a, oh, gee, the, the gauge is gone. Let me go put on my wetsuit and run down there and fix it. Or let's pull up the uh, how many thousands of feet of pipe, right? It's pretty shocking when I read that, that there was a single gauge to monitor that thing. Pretty, pretty amazing, because uh, fixing it was not easy. In Fukushima, well, they just lack situational awareness generally. Right? They, that was just a mess. Um, I don't want to beat them up anymore. That, that's an easy target. It's like, it's like beating up your sister. That was situational awareness-wise. They didn't have meters to find out how much radiation was leaking when it did leak. It, it just, uh, yeah, it was a mess. So if you assume these rules are worth following, right? how do you get people to follow these rules? Well, I think inevitably the two sort of choices are, as an industry, we can self-regulate. Or as an industry, we're just going to have to accept what government comes up with. And there's already examples of this. right? Think about PCI. Right? The payment card industry was sick and tired of getting popped for losses. And what did they do? They self-regulated. They came up with the PCI DSS standards. Right? And for better or worse, they exist now, and, and if you handle credit card data, you have to deal with them, right? Um, and those solve the particular problem. Now, the one thing that sort of scares me about PCI is when you hear not the same problem being solved with PCI. Oh, we have a, a data privacy issue. We'll just use the PCI standards. Well, wait a minute. That may or may not apply. PCI was worried about losing financial money. They were worried about credit card and data security. They weren't necessarily solving your problem. So government regulation at some point uh, scares me a bit. And quite honestly, it's really tricky to determine what the right level of regulation is, right? Where's that magic line between it's enough to keep people honest and it's not too much to 
actually be a drain on business. Right? That's a very, very tough road, super gray area, who, who the heck knows? So this is one of those things where, unfortunately, I'm kind of hoping we self-regulate because at least we can change probably faster than government. We hope. Well, PCI has ramped several times, so yeah. Apparently we can change faster than government. Ah, another thing about when I started sort of researching into this area is there's this thing that I wasn't aware of called safety case regulation. And this is kind of an interesting idea, and I think it's fairly applicable into building software. That I, the idea here, right, is instead of following a, a checklist of mandated things, right, a guideline, a, a what have you, a list, right, these are the n number of things you must do. Instead of that, you turn it around and you say, you explain to me why the system is safe under all possible conditions. What have you done to handle these possible conditions? And if you think about it for a minute, oh, wait, let me, oops, I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> um, and by the way, put this case in writing, and in some cases get it signed so management realizes how they've accepted risk and what they're doing about it. And then also take those cases. If you say you're going to handle input validation by output encoding, test it. Right? Now you actually have a means to test what they say they're going to do. This can sort of guide your testing when you're actually testing the, well, in this case, the regulatory issue, but this could also apply to software. And to me, this sounds a whole lot like a threat model, right? Because what's a threat model? You talk about what's going on with the software and what mitigations you have for threats. You put it in writing, and maybe it's signed off or not, right? And then if you're smart, you can hand that to your pen testers, and they can find weak areas of the system and test those. Because a lot of those things that, in the threat model stage are implementation. They're not, the software isn't written yet, but you know these are weak areas. If you're resource constrained for, constrained for testing, which everybody is, um, this is a great way to focus that testing and get the most bang for your buck. <coughs> now, the one thing with safety case regulation is it requires long-term relationships, right? It's just sort of hard to just drop in a body and have them talk about the safety case of a particular regulatory uh, body. And it would be the same thing for software. If you're just going to drop in and talk to developers, you probably don't have the street cred with them uh, to make it happen. Maybe, maybe not. It kind of depends. The other thing you have to have is a decent level of expertise, right? You can't, if you know nothing about software, you're not really going to be a very effective person doing threat modeling, even if you did read the book, right? Unfortunately, that's just the case, right? Issues with this? Well, this is problematic when you have systemic failures, right? Like, think of a bank, right? If a bank fails, not only does a bank fail, but there can be cascading failures. People have money in the bank, lose money, that can cause a, a subsequent failure, right? So in cases like that, this doesn't work very well. Um, and if you do this right, it's sort of a combination of collegial and confrontational, right? Half of it is, and think about threat modeling, this is the same thing, right? Half of it, you're sort of one-on-one -on -one with the developers, you know, hey, I feel your pain, how are we gonna work around this problem? And the other part is a little bit of confrontational, there's a little bit of calling the baby ugly and threat modeling, like, why did you do this? This doesn't make sense to me, right? So there's some interesting parallels. And some interesting twists that I found on safety regulation, right? Have people not only make a case for safety, have them make the case for how they're gonna react to failures, right? What's gonna happen when something goes wrong? You say you have this mitigation, let's say it goes away, right? We have these unfixed vulnerabilities in our app, we bought a WAF. Therefore, it's fixed. Well, that's great. What if the WAF dies? Right? Let's talk about that. How are you going to handle those failures? Because they're probably going to happen. Right? This is basically saying, how are you going to fail when that brutal spine of technology breaks and you're sort of in open water in between the spines where there's no real tech to save you? Right? So think about the unthinkable. Right? What's going to happen? Okay, let's talk about handling software failures. That was also a little bit high level in general. Let's talk about software failures, right? Perfect software, right? We would all like it. And we're gonna practice and practice and practice. And eventually we're gonna have our REST-based API and it's gonna be beautifully humming along and our SOA is gonna handle requests carefully. And it's this beautiful orchestrated thing, right? But inevitably, the disaster is gonna happen, <laughs> right? It, it never fails. These are professional skaters. I imagine they skate a lot. And this still happens, right? And guess what? This happens with our software. So really the question is, when the inevitable happens, where, what are you going to do with that? What decision are you going to make around failure? So it's not if your software has problems. 
Because software has problems. That's a given. What's really the case is how you react to the problems, right? And if you can have an honest and open environment where problems can be talked about, you have a much better chance of having a happy face as opposed to a freaked out face. And by the way, I was searching for reaction photos for this page and Google Images, and I, I just had to put this in. I'm, I'm interrupting my own slide deck. It's awesome. The reaction ball. For $9.95 and 10 report points, you can get the action ball where you and your friends can dress up in athletic clothes and bounce a ball to each other. <laughs> I just, I couldn't believe this, so I had to throw it in. That was just like, the reaction ball. That's awesome. It's fun for a boy and a girl. So let's talk a little bit how not to react, right? Ah, and this just happened uh, last week or the week before. I don't remember the exact timing of it, but it's in the last couple of weeks. Patrick Webster, this guy in Australia, um, there's this thing called the superannuation, which I don't understand because I've never been to Australia, but apparently it's the sort of uh, federal government or the Australian government's mandatory retirement program. Right? And you have these like superannuation companies that hold your retirement somehow. I guess sort of like a, a federal level 401k-ish sort of thing. I don't perfectly understand it, but luckily it's not important to make the point of the story. But Patrick Webster, he's in Australia, and he has this uh, federal or, or government-mandated retirement plan with first state superannuation, right? And he found this crazy, ridiculous, simple flaw in the website. In fact, what he did is he was pulling a report of his, I think, deductions or something uh, for a previous month, and he noticed a numeric ID in the, in the URL, and he, like, added one to it. And sure enough, his coworker's statement came up. He and his coworker had hired at the same time, and they incremented their ID number by one. He thought, oh dear God, this is kind of bad, and this is like web app mistake 101. So he's actually, he's in the business. He's a, he's a researcher, a pen tester. So he wrote a little shell script to test this out and pull down, it was either 500 or 100, I don't remember how many, but to pull out a few of them to see if it was just this like an oddball chance, or is this really an a, a app-wide pro problem? And he went and made some tea. Comes back, and sure enough, he has 100, 500 records. And he says, oh, this is bad. And he calls them and reports it to him. Now, the IT guys he talked to at first were like, "Super! oh, this is great, thank you. Oh, my goodness, this is terrible. We need to fix this. They were okay with it, but apparently it bubbled up to management. And how do you think that, that reaction was? Right? Well, first off, they sent the police to his house. Right? Uh, presumably for breaking the law, though when the police investigated it, they just kind of said, eh, nothing really happened. They also uh, asked for all of his computers to be turned over to them so they could verify that there was no more client data on their machines. These are the people who can't write the web app good enough to not be vulnerable, but they want to check your machine to make sure you deleted it. And by the way, this guy's a pen tester who's had the data for how long? If he wanted to keep that data, it's already kept. <laughs> right? Five minutes? Oh my God, I'm going to go fast. <laughs> um, and then he had lawyers send a nasty letter to him, right, saying, you broke the law, we're closing your account, and they actually wanted him to pay to fix the problem he found, right? This is not how to react, right? This is insane. And this came, this kind of got viral in the Australian press. They got, uh, this company got tons of bad press. And basically what happened was a lot of, let's call them pro bono testers, started <laughs> testing the site and then dropping what they found on full disclosure. Right? This is not the reaction you want. Right? The lesson here, don't do this. And if you have people upstream from you that are losing your mind, I'm sorry, you're a security professional. It's your job to talk them off the cliff and not let them do this to your company. Because that did not help first superannuation at all. Right? So how should you react? Well, we have bug bounties. Right? And quite honestly, just good plain common sense. Google Mozilla, they have these in place and they've been highly effective. It's a way to incentivize uh, uh, responsible disclosure, and I think it's a pretty good thing. Internally, right, can you have some sort of premium, a free cup, a mug, a anything? $10 at the company store for people that report software so you can make a culture where people aren't afraid to talk about problems and avoid that sea of green like happened to Ford. Uh, testing failures, right? This is one of the things that's been bothering me for a long time. Testability of software, right? Because in that design review, you actually talked about how you're going to test this eventually when it gets to, you know, uh, pre-prod and then prod, right? That's all sorted. No, it isn't, right? Where are you going to test it? How are you going to test it? Can you uh, create accounts? Are there weird dependencies, right? To test this API, I have to have an account on this system, but also has to have an account on this system. Is that even known, right? 
And then the data in, that you're testing, right, is it real data? Is it pushed from production? How does that work? That's kind of a big mess. And guess what? Testing will happen. It's just a matter of when and where. Pre-fail warnings. This is one of the things I wanted to talk about, the app sensor project. Right? This is situational awareness for your apps, and I think this is a hugely powerful idea. It talks about 50 different detection points that you can place in your apps where you can sort of get a hint that things are going wrong. It tells you some guidance on how to respond. And you can take actions like log out the user, log it to a sim, lock the account, kill their session. Right? And then it talks about thresholds. Maybe the third time they do this sort of bad thing, you want to lock them out, but they get a couple chances because you're not exactly sure it's bad. Right? And you can finally know what's happening to your app. And actually, Michael Coates, the guy who started this project, has done the same thing for Mozilla, and they're pushing app events to their sim. And in real time-ish, they can tell what's going on with their apps, which is fundamentally awesome, man. That would be really cool. And it's the framework, stupid, right? If you're picking a framework, you might want to actually look to see if the framework has talked about security. And luckily, they're starting to get the itch, right? The Lyft framework and Web2Pi actually talk on their websites how they handle the OWASP top 10. The .NET framework has consistently added security features over time. That's really cool because now developers get it for free. And don't buy fail, right? Use the procurement process to block fail. Look at the OWASP legal project and the OWASP ASVS, which is a sort of way to uh, measure how uh, assured you can be that when the uh, producer of the software says it will protect against A, B, and C, that they're really doing it. And modify your contracts, right? Make security bugs be equivalent to feature bugs and have them fixed at the vendor's expense, particularly if you have the leverage to do this. Um, and require testing prior to purchase. Now, testing can either be internal if you have the bandwidth. If it's external, I would say provide them a list of blessed vendors because you don't want the person writing your software doing the race to the bottom and getting Bob and John's hack and shack for $49.95 testing your web app, right? You want quality testing. And then lawyers are risk managers, right? Bring them to your side. Talk about the risk of security software and get them on your side because you're going to be talking to them anyway if you're changing contracts. Okay, why OWASP will win? We have a motivated community. And I did a little bit of research, and this was uh, must started a while back, but I was curious in how you motivate a community, right? I'm on the board of OWASP. We have a large community. How do you motivate a community? And some interesting research that came out of MIT, uh, the University of Chicago, and Carnegie Mellon economists was they looked at the traditional way of incentivizing people, which is we give you a bonus, right? If you do something better, faster, quicker, we'll give you an extra dollar. And they found out, which didn't make sense, was that a larger reward when you're doing a task that requires some creative thinking or mild cognitive skills, it actually leads to worse performance, which defied the laws of behavioral physics and confused the heck out of these poor guys, right? This is Texas, right? It's a real head scratcher. They had no idea what to do with this. Well, they did some more research, and what they found out is the factors that lead to better performance is autonomy, right? If you're doing a creative role, you want autonomy. You have a desire to be self-motivated, and you don't want to be micromanaged. And that shouldn't be any surprise to anybody in here. Mastery, right? You have the urge to master something. This is why people that are not musicians go buy a guitar and every weekend twiddle around on it and slowly get better, right? It's not that you think you're going to become a musician and suddenly replace the, you know, the hottest guy on the charts. You just want to get better at something. It's why people golf, why people fish, whatever your hobby is. Right? And purpose, people want to be part of a larger mission. And OWASP delivers all three of these for our community. So this is a huge thing. And they, did, they did some more studies which had different words around it. You may see challenge mastery, making a contribution. But in essence, it's all the same. And this is something that at OWASP, we can give you, and there's a fantastic video, that RSA animation with the little squeaky marker on the board. It's 10 minutes out of your life. Watch this video. It is incredibly fantastic, and the slides will be available uh, for the conference because you don't have time to write that down, I imagine. I'm out of time. Anyway, um, and OWASP. OWASP is a meritocracy, right? I may be on the board, but I have very little power and lots of responsibility and no pay. I mean, that's honestly how it works. The power in OWASP is not me. It's not Tom, another board member. It's our community. It's the people running the chapters. Josh and James have run the Austin chapter for a long time now. They're the reason I'm here talking, right? A chapter decided they wanted to do a conference, and now we're in the second year of LastCon. And next year, AppSec US is here. That's because of a couple people in one town, right? With OWASP, you can really make a difference. Final thoughts, right? 
Some may ask, is failure an option? Well, I'd say failure is everywhere, right? You can't avoid failure. And under those constraints, let's find a way to find success through failure. Questions? I have no idea where I am on time. Where am I time? I'm out of time. No questions. I do this because I have two kids that like standing in buckets of ice and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Matt. Um, if you look into your program schedule, uh, there's going to be conference sessions held in this room as well. We should be starting in about five minutes. So go mingle, find the track you need to go to, and then um, um, have fun. <laughs>